Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. The title of our first panel is Paths Taken, and the speakers will be discussing the history of Singapore's political parties, as well as the impact of regional and international politics on Singapore. The chairperson of this panel is Professor Tan Tai Yong, the president of Yale and U.S. College. Thank you, and good morning. Welcome to this first panel discussion, Paths Taken. Uh, let me begin by making reference to a book that was published about 10 years ago, I think it was in 2007, by a group of scholars, uh, and the book was called Paths Not Taken. Paths Not Taken. The essays all dealt with the theme of political pluralism in post-war Singapore, and there was a ferment of ideologies, priorities, perspectives, and social visions, different types, for the future of Singapore. They were all offering different visions for Singapore's future, across the entire political spectrum, and these visions are often contested or conflicted with one another. That volume was actually an interesting scholarly and intellectual exercise on the question of what if, what if? What if a different path had been taken? Or what if Singapore as a country had to move on many different paths? Well, the objective of this panel is not to discuss the what if, but it will analyze the political landscape in Singapore by examining the paths that were actually taken. The paths ahead for Singapore were indeed quite clear in 1965. It was clear that Malaysia was no longer an option. Singapore had willy-nilly become a sovereign nation state. And with the benefit of hindsight, we all know the path that was chosen. The PAP government had a sense of what it wanted to do, had to do. Their opponents had different ideas and chose different approaches, but a combination of political miscalculations uh, had weakened the opposition and it lost the way somewhat. And while the PAP government seemed to be all dominant domestically by the late 1960s, they had to contend with larger geopolitical forces that would shape their thinking, approaches, and directions. So the paths and options that were taken from 1965 would be shaped by a combination of political actors, historical experience, circumstances of the time, chance, and geopolitics, among other factors. What lie behind the paths taken, taken at the time, therefore warrant closer study and analysis. We will need to better understand the situation we are in today and what changes we can expect in the future. So we have three well-known speakers who will share their insights and analysis on several of these issues in this morning's panel. I will only introduce them briefly, but they are well-known uh, personalities in Singapore. I'm sure you know them, but if you want more details, their bios are in the conference booklet. Um, I'll introduce them in the order that they are speaking. First, on my immediate right, Dr. Lam Peng Er. Dr. Lam is a political scientist and senior fellow at the East Asian Institute at NUS. Um, he has, he's actually a Japanese uh, politics expert but he has also written extensively on Singapore and is the co-editor of this book, which is very important, called Lee's Lieutenants. Uh, Dr. Lam will discuss the roles, choices, and contribution of Singapore's old guard and reflect on the development of the PAP uh, in the present and near future. Following Dr. Lam will be Ms. Zuraida Ibrahim. Zuraida is currently Deputy Executive Editor of the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. She was previously Deputy Editor of the Straits Times and also has written very extensively on Singapore politics. She co-authored the book Lee Kuan Yew, Hard Truths uh, to Keep Singapore Going, published in 2011, and also a monograph on the Singapore opposition published in 2017. Uh, Zuraida will discuss the development and contributions of opposition parties to Singapore's politics, and in a similar vein, reflect on their development and the future of Singapore's opposition parties. Last, but certainly not least, will be Mr. Bilhari Kausikan. Um, Mr. Kausikan is, uh, was the firm sec of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs from 2001 to 2013 and has held various positions in the ministry and abroad, including post of Singapore's uh, perm rep uh, to the United Nations in New York and ambassador to the Russian Federation. Um, he's currently the um, chairman of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. Um, Bilhari will discuss how Singapore's politics had been shaped by and are shaping relations with our immediate and uh, distant neighbours, and he will provide perspectives on the development 
in the context of the relations uh, of politics in the context of this relationship and also how Singapore politics will evolve in the near future. So without further ado, I will invite uh, Dr. Lam to uh, uh, make his presentation. Um, Dr. Lam will speak from the podium, um, but some of the speakers may choose to speak from um, uh, the table here. So I'll, I'll leave it to them to decide. So over to you. Thank you, Taeyong. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, IPS instructed me to do two things. First, to uh, analyze the roles and the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew and his key lieutenants. And second, to talk about the trajectory of the PAP past, present, and future. So my presentation within the next uh, 19 and a half minutes will be uh, Jaina's face. Looking at the back, looking forward, it's like driving a car, you know? When we move forward, path taken, we also look at our rear mirror, reflect upon the past. Lee's lieutenants, I think the die was cast uh, and the founding fathers set a template of good governance in Singapore. And uh, they have established the values and ideals okay, of meritocracy, non-corruptibility, multiculturalism, and ethnic equality. Okay, these are the ideals. We are a nation uh, work in progress. Um, I cannot say we have achieved this perfectly, but then again, um, can we name any countries in Southeast Asia which have done better than this? Certainly, all the Southeast Asian countries are multicultural, but uh, in terms of meritocracy, non-corruptibility, and ethnic equality, have they done better than us? I don't mean to be hubristic, okay? Uh, a friend uh, saw my slides and said, hey, you know, this is like apple pie motherhood statement. Um, but many Singaporeans have already embraced and internalized these values. And I would say the logical extension of these values in the years ahead for the PAP, for Singapore. Why can't we have a non-Chinese prime minister? Right? Heng Sui Kiat is an ethnic Chinese, but what about his uh, successors? C can, can we have? Is it conceivable? Is this desirable? So, uh, will that be a path taken? It's open-ended. Old guard, I think they made a virtue out of necessity. They harnessed the dynamism of international capitalism, open economy, foreign investments. Uh, very critical. You, you need to create jobs, good jobs, essential for political stability, social stability. But they have actually tempered it with socialism, uh, socialistic benefits for the masses, uh, housing, education, healthcare. And Singapore's equivalent to fundamental land reforms the equivalent to land reforms, I think, is the superb public housing program, which created a property owning working class and middle classes. So we have avoided uh, the, the fate of Hong Kong. And I think this may be surprising to some of you when I argue that uh, Lee and his lieutenants, they were revolutionaries, but I think it's a bloodless revolution from above. Public housing, nation building, to forge a national identity, identity within one generation, national conscription, bilingual language policies, very contentious. I think they were revolutionaries, but what about the 2G, 3G, uh, 4G leaders? Uh, by and large, uh, they are technocrats, technocratic leadership. Uh, you may think they are reformers or not, but I think they fine-tuned the system, they kept the flag flying. So, uh, I think the style of governance may change, but the fundamental values remain essentially the same. But what about the future? And our system, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in uh, mainland China, and my Chinese scholars and friends, they talk about Xinjiang Moshi, the Singapore model. We have trained more than 55,000 mainland Chinese officials in, in Singapore. I think that's simply remarkable. Right? Kim Jong-un came here, and, he's, and he, Marina Sands, I think, was uh, across the road, upstairs, the other side, and he said, oh, uh, Singapore social order is very good. It can be a point of reference for uh, DPRK. 
Okay, so this is our Singapore. But what about the future in a turbulent world? Duvaja, uh, French political scientist, have this uh, very interesting hypothesis. He argued, okay, let me, let me read, the dominant party wears itself out in office. It loses its vigour, its arteries harden. It would thus be possible to show that every domination bears within itself the seeds of its own destruction. So is it the done deal that the PAP will still, still be the ruling party uh, two or three decades from now? The PAP seemed to have defied Duvijaya's uh, prediction thus far. Look at Congress Party of India, a perennial one-party dominant, gone. Across the causeway, AMNO is in the, uh, in the opposition now. Uh, the party which I spent a lot of time examining, the Liberal Democratic Party of J Japan, in power from 1955 till 1993, out, back in power in 94, and between 2009 to 2012, it was in the opposition. Okay, so, so it's interesting. Is the PAP going to be the last perennial one party in the world? Right? PKI of uh, Mexico have gone, uh, the Christian Democrats of uh, Italy has gone. So the puzzle is why did the PAP succeed in maintaining uh, one party dominance since 1959? So this question, I'm sure everyone has uh, different views. Um, I would argue quality of the leaders, ability to attract talent and the smooth passing of the baton, political baton. That's why we have 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, question mark. Okay? The institutions, norms and blueprint of governance established by the old guard, I think it resonated with the electorate. If these values are not embraced by uh, Singapore citizens, I think they, will, they would have been thrown out of, uh, out of office. Successful economic stewardship. And I dare say that for the majority of voters in Singapore, they do find life in Singapore rather tolerable, very good for some, on the whole. Even if there are unhappiness with specific public policies, such as public transportation, uh, problems with, the, with our trains, and immigration policies. Path dependency, path not taken, path dependency. Uh, I have no time to talk about the strategic blunder of the Barisan Socialist to boycott the 1968 election. Um, I think this morning someone raised about uh, raised the issue of proportional representation. I think that's uh, true to a certain extent. Um, you, you look at 2011 general election, right? The opposition captured almost 40% of the votes, of the popular votes. But how many seats did they garner in parliament? Uh, the other thing to note is uh, the PAP is really, really impressive at the grassroots. No? If we talk about Lee as the captain, his uh, lieutenants, and who, who are the sergeants and the warrant officers? I think it's your, <laughs> your PAP MPs down at the grassroots, at the trenches. I think they work really, really hard. You know? uh, very, very, very impressive Singaporeans. Uh, with any problems, you go and see, and you see your MP, I don't think you leave empty handed if you are really, truly in need. So PAP is a very, very disciplined cadre party. It's not faction. Ridden. Although some people joke that it is a Leninist party, you know, uh, democratic centralism. The advantage of uh, perennial rule by the PAP, uh, symbiotic ties with the state machinery, NTUC, uh, strong influence on media, and it had extended its hegemonic values to society. I don't think it's just uh, propaganda, coercion, you know, but many Singaporeans actually embraced the values which I mentioned, articulated by the old guard. And as an incumbent party, uh, it's, for example, I don't think it's beholden, it's fairly autonomous, it's not beholden to the big property developers like Hong Kong. Okay, what is the road ahead? I'm actually not, uh, I'm not unduly worried about uh, the uh, financial means of Singapore. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear-mongering uh, by some Singaporeans and said, hey, our HDB leases will run out. But actually, we, we have more than sufficient uh, for a population of 5.7 million. Um, 
more chess estimation, more than $1 trillion. Right? If we have the political will, and if state and society can forge a national consensus, surely we can deal with the, the homeless of slightly more than 1,000 people, right? We have more than a trillion dollars, for goodness sake. I mean, can, can we do something? Can we do better? Uh, future of PAP, they can prudently dip into the national reserves, but under a constitution, uh, you need the consent of the elected president and the CPAA, if need be, in the wake of black swan events, domestic challenges, and external threats. So we do have the financial wherewithal to weather crisis. And from uh, DPM's uh, discussion, questions raised on the floor, we are cognizant that Singapore society will be more pluralistic, more global, diverse in values and interests in the years ahead. The question mark is, can we maintain unity in diversity? Okay, is this a motherhood question? Motherhood and apple pie? Uh, unity in diversity without leading to fragmentation and issues in, in our society. And obviously, the PAP must evolve and adapt. Likewise, opposition parties, right? So, uh, the PAP, which have addressed the politics of survival so well, our separation from Malaysia in 65, to politics of aspiration, identity, among a diverse, better educated, and cosmopolitan electorate, and, and we can see, you know, the PAP seem to have uh, uh, calibrated its public policies, shifted from a more like neoliberal market oriented, especially in the 1990s, to after 2011, somewhat more socialistic. I think they've done so uh, in response to electorate to stay in power. It has actually offered more generous benefits from national coffers uh, to the working class, older workers, and retirees. Example better housing subsidies, rise in bursaries, grants for preschool and tertiary education, uh, pioneer medical generations, including uh, healthcare subsidies. Okay, all these are genuine uh, benefits for the population. Okay, food for thought. PAP's hegemonic control of political narratives and facts. POFMA was mentioned a few times this morning um, will it be effective? Could you imagine in, in future elections, if you have uh, opposition parties, civil societies, individuals making uh, all kinds of statements, how, how are we going to enforce it? Will the high courts be overloaded? Uh, are we going to go after them selectively? Uh, certain things are black and white. No? It's quite clear. Certain things can be very obvious. That this is a blatant lie. But in life, there are 50 shades of grey. So who decides? <laughs> What is true and what is not? Are we going to be caught in an X file situation where the truth is somewhere up there and it's really con you know, up to the, the High Court judge to decide what is fake and what is real? So I'm not quite sure. I mean, in principle, it is necessary, but implementation, I, I'm not sure. It's uh, too early to tell. Uh, PMET problem. Uh, how are we going to address rising social inequality? Now, social inequality is something which is endemic across the board. Right? You go to Davos, uh, Prime Minister is off to, uh, to Davos. Oxfam, every year, release a certain statistics. There are seven, 7 billion people in the world. But 50 men, okay? Men is not humankind, you know? It, it means masculine males. You know? 50 men controls more than 50% of the global wealth. You know, there's something wrong, right? It is really vulgar. So, Singapore is so globalized. Can we escape from global trends of social inequality? And can political parties attract the support of millennials? Um, my, my daughter is a millennial. I mean, she thinks very differently from me. You know? So, <laughs> I mean, good luck to Mr. Heng Sui Kiat and uh, PAP. Because how are you going to convince the millennials? Big challenge. Uh, will the PAP leadership remain united in the post Lee Hsien Long era? So I'm not sure what's going to happen to him when he step down as prime minister, whether he'll be a senior minister and uh, become a senior Minister Mentor, well, I've, I've no idea, okay? But can PAP afford a Team B without splitting, without tearing itself apart, okay? So 1955, what was the population size of Singapore? 1959, when PAP uh, became the ruling party, self-government, 
what was the population size of Singapore? Probably slightly under 2 million. But now, 5.7 million. Uh, surely with, uh, you look at the talent pool of the PAP, look at the MPs, uh, the activists, very impressive. Is there no space for Timbi? Now, this may be a bit controversial, huh? political elitism. Uh, I will qualify it by saying that I cannot come across any political systems in the world where there are no e elites. It's a matter of degree. But in case of Singapore, um, can the PP, PAP's governance evolve from a small elite circle to greater political participation and transparency in governance? Let citizens, for example, know the value of our national reserves. Um, and yesterday was very interesting. You read, you read the Straits Times, you come across this figure. Oh, the United Nations Social and Development uh, Department uh, mentioned that 44% of our foreign migrants come from Malaysia, 18% from uh, mainland China and so on. So it's quite strange for a Singapore citizen to hear this from the United Nations rather than from the government of Singapore. Okay? So can citizens have access, civil society access to information? So it's not just helping hands, but thinking heads. We need accurate information. No accurate information, then you may end up with POFMA, fake news, and so on. I, I don't know. Can a small political elite circle make mistakes? What do you think? Yes, electoral backlash in G2011 over immigration, housing, and transportation. Uncharacteristically, Prime Minister Lee Sen Long apologized. What did he apologize uh, about? Mistakes were made in uh, public policy. We have a, a very good civil service, uh, intelligent MPs, ministers, among the best paid in the world, but mistakes can be made, right? So in the years ahead, is there an inherent danger for the PAP and Singapore if a small elite circle were to make major mistakes? Is it unthinkable, inconceivable? And are we all putting our political eggs in one basket? What if a future PAP, Team A, were to fail? Is that Team B? Is that Team C? And this word, natural aristocracy, came from Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong when he spoke to Faris Zakaria in uh, 2015. But, uh, but when he talked about the natural aristocracy, he said it must be earned. Uh, it, it doesn't mean natural aristocracy. It's a silver spoon in your mouth. So uh, my question mark is, Will the PAP's so-called natural aristocracy in the future be based on the no nobility of character rather than the privilege of birth and political dynasties? Um, I'm a, a Japan specialist. You know, one third of the lower and upper house members of parliament come from political dynasties. And uh, in future, Koizumi Shinjiro will be uh, prime minister of Japan. Probably two, you know, after Abe Shinzo, will be someone and our person, and then Koizumi Shinjiro. He's a fourth generation politician in democratic Japan. So what about Singapore? Are we going down that route? Is that going to be the path taken? So what's, uh, what are the more formidable political challenges to the PAP? Uh, yeah, I think I met a number of opposition members here. I think you, you must be able to answer this question better than I. Can you, members of the opposition, attract talent in greater numbers and offer a narrative which counters the PAP's hegemonic ideolo ideological discourse. You don't have a message, you don't have a story, you cannot attract people. You cannot just blame the PAP, you know, PAP for repression, for propaganda and so on. So I, I think that's, that's the way to go. And uh, trillion dollar question, why, why trillion dollar? I think because we have more than a trillion in our national reserves. Can the PAP in the decades ahead Avoid duvages theory, duvages trap. That all dominant political parties are doomed to be train, thrown out of power. Dominant political parties will eventually be thrown out of power. Is that the fate of the P PAP? It may not be so apparent today. Uh, maybe they'll be around in power for a decade or two, but beyond that, uh, I, I wish I can ask you guys to take a vote, you know, not to embarrass you, but you just click and the statistics will appear on the screen. Uh, so, but I'm sorry, uh, I'm not clairvoyant, so I cannot answer the question. Some of you can, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah.
Time's... Yes, thank you. Thank okay. You. Uh, well, thanks for keeping to time. It's a pretty compact presentation with many interesting questions, including a trillion dollar one. We hope that we'll be able to discover the answer to that. Um, now I'd like to invite Zoraida Ibrahim to present her paper on the opposition. Zoraida, please. Thank you, Tayong. Good morning, everyone. I'm from South China Morning Post, based in Hong Kong, but I'm a Singaporean. I'm one of those adapter plugs that DPM Heng talked about, trying to make it overseas, but I'm a three-pin plug at the core. So, <laughs> when the organizers first approached me last August, there was a chance that elections would have been over by this time. This would have presented us with a far easier task of post-morteming the results with a 2020 vision of hindsight. Alas, as things stand, we are still trying to peer into a fog. We don't have a date yet. We don't have the shape of the electoral map. We don't have a good idea of the new faces, and we don't know what the domestic and international environment will be like. We know from past elections that they always throw up surprises, defying the pundits. It may look like an issueless election weeks before the campaign. Indeed, someone told me over dinner this weekend that the only issue that seemed to matter was PMDs. <clears throat> but things can change rather quickly. We also know that the opposition, 11, of whom, uh, 11 members of whom are here, I'm told, uh, is good at keeping its cards close to its chest. Think back to how well the Workers' Party's Mr. Lau Tia Kiang guarded the secret of him leaving his safe perch of Haogang for the Aljunate GRC uh, contest in 2011. I think despite these uncertainties, we can identify a few givens about the opposition, as well as a few known unknowns, so to speak. I'll start by highlighting three relatively stable factors that I believe are unlikely to change in the coming election. They're not big surprises, but I think it might be useful to uh, know these things to frame our discussion. First, the opposition is not a government in waiting. Furthermore, that's not what most voters expect from them. They function as a potential check on the ruling party, a means for citizens to exert pressure on the PAP government. In this sense, Singapore is fundamentally different from a, two, from a full two-party or multi-party system where elections are about political parties vying for their turn to rule. Instead, we have a dominant party system with the PAP entrenched as the party of government, while opposition parties reflect Singaporeans' desire to impose a certain level of accountability on that government. That's not going to change in 2020. The dominant party context helps explain why most voters do not expect the opposition to have fully formed platforms with detailed policy proposals. The PAP, understandably, finds this very frustrating. It has criticised such voting behaviour as irresponsible and warns that this is opposition for opposition's sake. Nevertheless, many voters will continue to use their vote as a way to deliver a desired level of check and balance, rather than to decide who should govern Singapore for the foreseeable future. That is a non-issue. So although every election is a guessing game, most of the speculation is simply about exactly what level of accountability Singaporeans seek during a particular election cycle. We have seen the opposition make surges that spark speculation about whether we are on track to a 1.5 party system only to have the electorate cost correct and vote more conservatively in the follow following election. Clearly, the electorate wants some opposition, but either too much or too little makes the public nervous. As a way to break through this cyclical pattern, the opposition has been trying to sell the idea that voters need to deny the PAP of the supermajority of two-thirds of parliamentary seats. This would allow the opposition to block constitutional changes. But there is no evidence that this call has been particularly effective. The second given is that the opposition parties will not form any grand coalition. Minor parties may team up, but big ones won't. At most, they will enter into minor packs to avoid three-cornered fights. I often hear Singaporeans lamenting the fractured state of the opposition. In Malaysia, when Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad's Pakatan Harapan coalition ousted Barisan in 2018, 
Some argued that Singapore op Singapore's opposition would make headway if it was similarly united. This Singapore, Sing these Singaporeans think this unity explains the opposition's lack of success. But this is a fallacy. Opposition disunity is a reflection of voters' own lack of consensus about the kind of political competition they want. Different voters are attracted to different types of opposition. Therefore, there is no single proven formula for both satisfying hardcore opposition voters while at the same time attracting swing voters, first-time voters and loyal PAP voters who may be tempted to defect. To put it simply, it's unclear whether the opposition's best bet is to position itself as a radical alternative to the ruling party or a sort of PAP light. A party that differentiates itself sharply from the PAP by promising free health care, for example, will no doubt appeal to some voters, but will also alienate many others who might see such pro promises as fiscally irresponsible. On the other hand, a PAP-like party that only promises changes at the margins will similarly not be able to please all opposition voters, all potential opposition voters. Singaporeans also have different views about the style of politics they want. Some prefer their opposition MPs to speak in measured and reasonable tones. Others want a bolder, more confrontational approach that shows they will be able to get the better of ministers during parliamentary debates. This is a dilemma that's not unique to Singapore. The same dynamic is visible in the Democratic Party in the US and Labour in the UK. When you are in the opposition, do you move to the centre or do you move further left? It would be foolish, I think, to underestimate the complexity of this decision. And so we shouldn't be surprised to see opposition parties continue to be divided about how to go about their way forward. The WP is the most successful opposition party of the last 25 years, so perhaps there's something to be said for its controlled and cautious approach, an approach that infuriates more impatient opposition supporters. Mr. Lau has been very careful about whom he feels and about the causes that he pushes. This is not surprising, seeing that he had a front row seat to seeing how the PAP demolished the Workers' Party's late Mr. J.B. Jayaratnam. Since Mr. Lau took over, the party has made sure everyone is on message, there are no loose cannons, and they are almost as paranoid of the media as the PAP is. <clears throat> To Mr. Lau's credit, over the years, he has also shared the limelight with Ms. Sylvia Lim and Mr. Pritam Singh, allowing them to grow in prominence as faces of the WP. But the WP clearly sees other opposition parties' candidates as potential liabilities to its brand, and thus it will resist forming coalition. The SDP tra traditionally has a bolder and more distinct platform, but its lack of electoral success under Dr. Chi Sun John has been quite striking since its heyday in, the 1990, in 1991. It has consistently performed worse than the opposition average. But it is not clear if this is because of its platform, its style of politicking, or a question of personality. It is possible that the PAP did such an effective job of disparaging Dr. Chi that his party has been rendered unelectable up to now. Yes, smaller parties are eager to uh, enter into a coalition. Four of them got together recently. Uh, I bet you most of you can't name all four of them. Um, and they're hoping for Dr. Tan Cheng Bok to lead them. I don't see this coalition improving the chances of these parties. The third constant that the opposition, that, that we should bear in mind is that the opposition will continue to benefit from the underdog advantage. Singapore voters may not have a great appetite for multi-party democracy, but they do have an innate sense of fair play. In their own lives, there are enough Singaporeans who feel the system favours privileged elites. So it is not surprising that they identify with candidates who seem to be victims of an overbearing government. The opposition plays the underdog card well, and the government seems to know this. 
Although it won't create a completely level playing field by allowing electoral boundaries to be set, say, by an independent election commission, for example, it knows it can't tilt the field to, shut, to, to such an extent that elections lose their legitimacy. This was why Prime Minister Lee Sian Leung said that ele elections needed to remain contestable. The size of GRCs has been shrunk over the past decade and more SMCs created to ensure that smaller parties can continue to contest. Thanks to the underdog advantage, voters will give opposition candidates some leeway as long as they do not have disqualifying deficits. The underdog advantage also means that attacks on the opposition may backfire if they are perceived as over the top. The PAP must be hoping that the government's allegations against the Workers' Party over its handling of its finances will persuade voters that they can't be trusted to run town councils. But it is quite possible that the smears won't just be discounted by the public, but will fire up voters to lend their support to a beleaguered opposition. Remember how the WP raised $1 million in three days through just one online post. This is a sign the PAP cannot ignore. Similarly, the recent string of POFMA interventions may be intended to prove to, to Singaporeans that opposition viewpoints or opposition facts are hollow, but they could instead, instead add to the perception of unfairness, especially since POFMA only works one way. It cannot be used by opposition politicians to correct false statements made by the PAP government. I would add this caveat, though, that the underdog advantage doesn't always apply. If the opposition candidate is a non-starter, he is not going to milk any advantage from any PAP attack. Another very important caveat. As the opposition appears to strengthen, Singaporeans will judge them by higher standards. This could help explain what happened during the 2015 campaign when there was a narrative going around about an impending opposition surge spread in part by WhatsApp messages about Buki's ads. Odds, a subject I will return to later, resulting in voters being less prepared to give the opposition a break. Now, let me turn very quickly to the unknowns, the new and less predictable factors in, the, in this election. I can think of three of them, but time is running out. I'll just go through to, to, to over to two of them. First, I think who really has the upper hand in the online battle for hearts and minds? For a long time, we have assumed that the untamed territory of cyberspace is ruled by opponents of the PAP. But the ruling party and the government were not sitting idly by, especially after the 2011 election. Government ministers and agencies develop a major official Facebook presence. They have also been supported by unofficial players like fabrications against the PAP, fabrications led by opposition parties, as well as many name and anonymous keyboard warriors and internet brigades. By the 2015 election, these efforts were already significant. Former IPS scholar Tan Tan Hao noted that we were seeing, quote unquote, a normalization of cyberspace. By this, he meant that Singapore's online space was beginning to resemble offline space. That is, largely middle of the road opinions with anti-government voices on the fringe. Just like in the real world, the government's voice was beginning to be among the loudest in the virtual world. This shift is partly because the internet is no longer a minority preoccupation. It is now more reflective of the general pub public. But it's also because the PAP, like many governments in the world, have embraced the internet and social media. I'd like to draw your attention to a very important study done by the Oxford Internet Institute last year covering 70 countries where they found that governments and political parties were engaging in various, various forms of social media manipulation and disinformation. The methods range from using social media to shape public attitudes, to using computational propaganda to suppress human rights, discredit political opponents, and drown out dissenting opinions. Foreign governments have also been known to use similar tools to cause trouble in other polities. The study did not cover Singapore, but it does remind us that internet tools are now at the disposal of all parties, governments included. And of course, since it's not cheap to use these tools at scale, governments with their superior resources can end up the big winners. 
as an editor whose readership is mostly online, I know being competitive in that space is now big business. Data analytics will matter in this election like never before. The internet has become an arms race. Money can make a difference. 2015 already gave a hint of how online rumours can sway voters. You will remember about the so-called bookies predictions that went viral. This prediction said that the opposition, the WP in particular, would win at least four GRCs and four SMCs. This could have been genuine bona fide bookies odds, which, in which case these bookies are probably out of business. Or there could have been attempts to manipulate public opinion. Perhaps the opposition started these rumours to energise their supporters. Perhaps the consensus among observers, like political scientist Bill Vyar Singh, is that the rumours of a big swing towards the opposition helped the PAP. This may have given voters, quote-unquote, cold feet, according to Bill Vyar. That's 2015. So the big question for 2020 is whether the government's massive investments in online platforms will make this the first election where the internet adds rather than subtracts from the ruling party's already huge offline advantage. It is hard to answer this because we don't even know what is in various parties' political as uh, uh, online arsenal. We can follow their official accounts, but nobody is tracking whether parties can and do micro-target voters, whether or not they are massaging public opinion, using trolls or fake accounts, and so on. I should also add that the online space remains fundamentally open. Again, as a person from the media, no matter how much resources a dominant organisation may pour into that space, there's only so much they can do to make their content go viral or to stop their opponent's content from going viral. Okay, very quickly, I think the second game changer in this election is the Tan Cheng Bok factor. Uh, Major opposition parties have done well to attract credible candidates, including those that the PAP might have also considered to be attract attractive candidates. But I think it is Tan Cheng Bok's entry into opposition ranks that is groundbreaking. He, is, he was no ordinary backbencher. He was a trusted CEC member. The question is whether he will pave the way for others. I've met a number of Singaporeans who have achieved all they want to their, in their careers and say they now want to contribute to society. They feel Singapore needs to change radically and not just cruise based on what's worked in the past. They are asking themselves, how can I best make a qualitative difference to Singapore? If they are establishment types, it may never have occurred to join, for them to join the opposition. Until now, would Tan Cheng Bok inspire others to follow in his wake? Um, of course, much depends on Tan Cheng Bok himself and how he wards off the inevitable verbal blows from the PAP. One big obstacle for him is that many young Singaporeans do not remember his days in Parliament. They know him from the 2011 presidential election, and his critics believe he is driven by personal interests and by the conviction that he was robbed of the elected presidency. Dr Tan has cast himself as someone who wants to reclaim the old PAP. The question is whether there are enough people who can tell the difference between the old and the current. Now, the third uncertainty is about how economic and geopolitical conditions will influence voters. In most countries, the state of economy is the best predictor of elections. The greater the economic turbulence, the more the people are likely to want to vote against the government of the day. In Singapore, it is different. Because of the PAP's status of the National Party of Government, Singaporeans have contradictory feelings towards the PAP. When times are bad, they may blame the PAP, and, that, and yet they may treat the PAP as a safe haven. This is the inner conflict of uh, many swing voters especially. It's like how the US dollar paradoxically holds firm or even strengthens when America's problems cause global turbulence. There is a flight to quality in the currency market. So the PAP is the US dollar of electoral politics, making it quite hard to predict how its value will be affected by economic and geopolitical uncertainty. On the one hand, the global pattern shows voters rejecting establishment politicians in uncertain times. But for the PAP, remember, the biggest ever jump in its vote share occurred in 2018. 
9-11 election, less than two months after the 9-11 attacks. In the coming election, the opposition may well gain from slower economic growth. Or voters may heed the PAP call for order and stability at a time of leadership transition. All I've done is to try and provide a framework to predict or to think about the opposition's chances uh, in the future. And I look forward to questions during our Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zoraida. Listen, listening to your presentation and also your analysis of the kinds of challenges and odds that are stacked against the opposition reminded me of a quip I heard recently about the difference between Singapore elections and the American presidential election. In the American system, you know when the election is going to happen, but you don't know who's going to win. In the Singapore case, you don't know when the elections are going to happen, but you kind of know who's going to form the government. Anyway, uh, so we move from domestic politics to geopolit uh, domestic scene to geopolitics, and it's my pleasure now to invite uh, Bilhari Kasikan uh, to present to us his take on how international relations have an impact on Singapore politics. Uh, I was asked to speak on how bilateral relations, which I take more generally as international relations, affects Singapore politics. And as the only official senior citizen among the speakers of the Medeka generation, I crave your intelligence to allow me to speak sitting down. <laughs> well, the most important foreign policy decision we have ever taken was to join Malaysia. It was also the most serious foreign policy miscalculation we have ever made. And in that apparent paradox lies the genesis of independent Singapore's politics. Speaking in the Singapore Legislative Assembly on 5th March 1957, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, and I quote, in the context of the second half of the 20th century, of 20th century Southeast Asia, island nations are a political joke. A political joke. Now, Mr. Lee made that statement during a debate on the constitutional talks in government. It reflected his conviction and the conviction of his comrades that merger with Malaya was the only practical way forward if Singapore were to completely shake off colonial rule. The political contest of the 1950s and early 1960s that led to merger and then separation were intertwined with the struggle between left and right within the Chinese Communist Party-backed United Front and with the contest against Chinese and Malay chauvinists in the context of broader global processes of decolonization and the Cold War. Those experiences shaped our independent political history. And to understand Singapore politics, we should juxtapose Mr. Lee's 1957 statement with other statements by him and other first-generation leaders describing their experiences in these tangled and incredibly complex processes. Now, speaking to Mr. Dennis Bloodworth about the PAP struggles in the communist-supported United Front, Mr. Lee said, and I quote, some mug had to do it. Dr. Goh King Sui echoed the sentiment, and I quote, there was really no choice. It was an act of reckless folly. We were five foolish young men, and we walked right into it. Now, Mr. Lee's 1957 statement was deterministic. The subsequent statements quoted by Dennis Bloodworth stressed agency and choice, cloaked, of course, in self-depreciating irony. As Mr. Lee, again quoted by Bloodworth, explained, and I quote, we wanted the British out. We believe nationalism to be a more potent force than communism. We pressed on regardless of the horrendous risks, end quote. Uh, our first generation leaders were practitioners, not theoreticians but they must have known of Thucydides' too often quoted dictum, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. As practitioners, they must have regarded it as, as best only partially true. Thucydides represents crude realism. Our first generation leaders were realists, but not crude realists. They understood that crude realism is sometimes not very realistic. There is always agency. 
fatalism is fatal. Were it not so, Singapore as we know it today would not exist. Too often crude realism is just an alibi for unwillingness to take risks, that is to say to act. There is no action without risk. Of course, not all risks work out. We all know what happened after merger. And what made it impossible for us to remain in Malaysia ultimately amounted to a point of political philosophy. In the terminology of the day, was it to be a Malaysian Malaysia or a Malay Malaysia? Our first generation leadership perhaps underestimated the vehemence with which the Malay leadership in Malaysia clung to the notion of Ketuanan Melayu, Malay dominance. Consequently, they underestimated the extent to which their vision of a Malaysian Malaysia, based on values we now call multiracial meritocracy, was unacceptable to the Malaysian Malay leadership. And the fundamental incomp incompatibility of these concepts is still the basic driving force underlying bilateral relations with Malaysia and in a slightly different way, Indonesia too. Uh, it was not a mistake that it would ever make again. Nor should we make the same mistake. But in retrospect, I think it was a happy mistake. Would we have been better off if we had abandoned or fundamentally compromised basic principles in order to remain within Malaysia? Well, looking at our neighbour today, it is difficult to come to that conclusion. The challenges of those early years were nevertheless very serious, indeed existential. In a book published in 1972, 70, seven years after we were forced out of Malaysia, a British academic by the name of Ian Buchanan predicted, and I quote, the future of the city-state of Singapore will be largely determined by events in the surrounding countryside of the Malay world and the Republic can do little more than wait, end quote. And he went on to say, and I quote again, the lines of domestic con conflict have already been drawn. Singapore's tragedy is not merely that insurrection will occur in the near future, but that if and when it does occur, it will threaten the very survival of Singapore in Southeast Asia, end quote. Well, needless to say, none of this happened. In truth, however, it was often a close-run thing. As Janaras Devan once wrote somewhere, we made, if we made no irretrievable errors, there was certainly a whole lot of trial. But what that British academic did not understand is how seriously we took multiracial meritocracy. Having risked an unexpectedly independent Singapore becoming a political joke over this value, we had to make the value work. We certainly did not, as that British academic predicted, do little more than wait. And so we are still here. The Singapore story is the story of the government and people refusely, refusing to meekly await their fate, but instead defiantly exercising the agency that is never entirely absent, even in the most daunting of circumstances, to ensure that the values for which we risk everything would succeed. That imperative shaped our politics and society. My key point is that there is always agency. There is always something that can be done. Politics, whether of the domestic or foreign variety, is about using the agency that is never entirely absent, even in the most dire of circumstances, to preserve, defend and advance the essential values on which our society is based and which is our unique value proposition. We cannot be just like everybody else. If a small country is just like every other country, it risks becoming irrelevant, a political joke. I think we have entered an era in which our unique method of organizing politics and society, and don't forget it is unique because in that enormous re region we now call the Indo-Pacific, every other country, without exception, organizes politics and society on the basis of a formal or informal ethnic or religious hierarchy. So our value proposition is going to be assailed by an array of powerful global forces that will seriously test that value proposition. Technologies of various kinds are forcing disruptive changes at a historically unprecedented pace. And this is weakening the sense of national identity and cohesion on which all politics must be based. Powerful centrifugal forces have been set in motion. 
This has caused transnational and subnational identities of various kinds to be aggressively asserted everywhere. And all this is occurring at a time when geopolitics is in a more than usual state of flux, and some major powers do not hesitate to try to harness identities for their own ends. I see no reason why Singapore should be somehow magically exempted from these global trends. Identity politics is already upon us, although usually not overly labelled identity politics. For example, lurking within debates about the role of foreigners in our economy is really a claim of hierarchy based on a different set of values, and such claims are far, far too often not uncontaminated, much as those who make them may deny it, by claims of ethnic privilege. That's only one example. A moment's thought will bring others to mind. We are going to hear much more about all these issues when the next general election gets underway. At the same time, I sense that, perhaps unsettled by the vast, impersonal and only dimly comprehended global forces that are swirling all around us, some Singaporeans feel deeply insecure in the face of a future that can be only glimpsed as a, through a glass darkly. I hope I am wrong, but that is what I sense. And this could make us vulnerable to external and internal snake oil salesmen peddling simplistic solutions. How do we deal with this? In broad outline, the essential problems that we now face are enhanced 21st century iterations of issues that we have faced down before. We were able to do so because our first gener generation leaders were a rare mixture, a rare blend of political skill and technocratic competence. That is why Singapore succeeded when so many other countries that gained independence around the same time floundered in the face of similar challenges. As Singapore prospered, politics receded. But we are now entering a period, and I think it will be a lengthy period, when leadership will again require a melding of political skill and technocratic competence. And so the lessons of our early political history are more relevant than ever and need to be re-emphasized. On that note, I will end. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bilari, for that um, very useful uh, history in uh, political, political evolution of Singapore, uh, the impact of Malaysia on Singapore's thinking, and also your emphasis that no matter how small a state you are, there is always agency, and you need to preserve that agency. That leaves us, I guess, a good half an hour to 45 minutes. You've heard three very good, strong papers. And I'm sure you must have questions for the speakers. So oh, I'm told 42 minutes. So um, may I invite now questions from the floor? Um, I guess there are ushers and all who can sort of uh, wave a red stick to show that you are waiting by the mic. So can I have uh, questions? Uh, Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I think you were here first, and then you. So first Thank question, you. we'll take, we'll we'll do what we did uh, in the morning session. Maybe two questions or three questions, and then um, we'll answer them collectively. Yes, please, sir. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Um, Matthew Ting from Silent Foundation again. Um, one one question sorry, I have. Sorry, can you say your name again? I think we missed. Uh, Matthew Ting from the Silent Foundation. Uh, my question is on uh, core values. Um, I mean. Ha has any of the, of, of the political parties in Singapore, uh, whether it's, it's the incumbent or the opposition, uh, come out to say what are their core values, this is what we stand for, and you know, when you, when, when you uh, go for an election, this is what you should, you should consider uh, 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 when voting. So then, then all the other things become uh, you know, uh, points of debate, frivolous, whatever. What, what, is, what, is, what really matters is the fundamentals. This, this, is, our, this is our stand, this is what we, uh, we do not compromise on, and, and, and this is what uh, we we are, uh, and, and I mean, uh, maybe around the pledge or something like that as, as the core values of Singaporeans. And I have another question which is uh, also uh, for, for uh, Bilahari uh, more specifically is, um, does Singapore's uh, uh, neighbours allow us to be neutral and have we ever considered uh, being a neutral country uh, in, the case of, like, in the case of Switzerland and is there any point in doing so? Thank you. So, I'm Minsa from UWC again, and since our first speaker brought up Hong Kong and the last speaker brought up 
the concept of determinism. I'm curious to what extent do you think the situation in Hong Kong can be viewed from a deterministic lens in the sense that the, to what extent do you think that the current situation in Hong Kong was almost inevitable due to the British values of many of the Hong Kong, of the Hong Kong people and the Chinese government's inability to make significant concessions due to the image of absolute power which they have built their authority on. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Gaiman from Nature Society. So I think it's obvious what my question is going to be. Um, this is addressed to all panelists. Um, as you know, the Prime Minister did identify climate change as the existential challenge for our future. I suppose even more existential than the um, Malaysian uh, issue was uh, the, the Singapore Malaysian issue was in the past. So my question to the panel is, um, since none of you have uh, really talked about uh, environmental stewardship and the role of our future political leaders and good governance in this, do you think this is something that is um, still not uh, going to be a main agenda issue that there are other, the same old issues, health, transport, uh, jobs, or do you think it's something that should be addressed very soon? Look at what happened to Australia, where they don't have any answers, at least the government doesn't have any answers, uh, despite the, the, the huge problems that uh, the lack of environmental stewardship has raised. Thank you. So I'm going to now invite the panelists to answer. Maybe I'll start with you first, Bilari. You can do the one on uh, neutrality and then take the others. And then we'll move on to the okay, let me, let me actually start with the one on core value. Uh, I think Singapore's official core value is multiracial meritocracy. And I don't think anybody, opposition or government, would overtly uh, deny that there's a However, that comes into conflict with other values. There's never only one value, you know? And what is the mixture is, in the cases of some opposition, a little bit fuzzy, to my mind at least. I may be wrong, but to me it's a bit fuzzy. Because electoral imperative may also bring you away from your core values. <laughs> uh, now let me go to the question about, will our neighbours allow us to be neutral like Switzerland? Get real. I mean, we are not like Switzerland because we don't live in the heart of Europe, which is a relatively peaceful region. Not as peaceful as the Europeans like to pretend, but still definitely more peaceful than Southeast Asia. And what do you, I don't understand what do we mean by neutral. You know? We don't go around commenting on the, on the neighbors' uh, foreign policy stances. In fact, many of them we share, for example, within ASEAN. So I'm not really clear what you mean by being neutral, but in any case, Neutrality in Southeast Asia, with regard to the big issues of our time, I think is well nigh impossible. Hong Kong, well, I said there's always agency, but agency has to be tempered with a sense of reality. I said that our, our first generation leaders were realists, but not true realists. Uh, and the balance between exercising agency and recognizing realism is actually the core political skill. Now, by coincidence, uh, just as PM last Friday was talking to the civil service, of which I am no longer a member, uh, about the necessity for political leadership and not just technocratic leadership, uh, I was having dinner with the dean of East Asian Studies, Mr. Ezra, Professor Ezra Vogel. And we were talking about Hong Kong. And we agreed, and I don't think Professor Vogel will mind me uh, uh, revealing this because he's going to talk in Hong Kong, and I'm sure he being him will say the same thing. That the Hong Kong government, Carrie Lam, and in fact, not just Carrie Lam, successive governments from the, since 1997, may have been very good at what I call the routine processes of government, making sure the garbage is collected, the streets are swept, and you know, 
trains run on time, electricity works and so on, but were miserable at political aspects of, government, of governance. Now, I don't see any alternative trajectory for Hong Kong. You can possibly mitigate the more violent process, but this, set, this path was set quite some time ago. It was set when the British decided to return Hong Kong to Chinese rule. Um, the political grievances, that, the socio-economic political grievances that underlie the protests we see can possibly be mitigated if there was good political governance, which does not exist at, at present. But I think we must also give due credit, if credit is the right word, to the last governor of Hong Kong and the British government of that time for handing China a political chalice. A poison chalice. We forget that the British ruled Hong Kong for 150 odd years as a damn colony, not a democracy. The Hong Kong people were subjects, they were not citizens. It was only at the very deathbed of British colonial rule that they raised expectations that they never had, they never tried to fulfill while they were in charge and head on over to China. Climate change. Well, I think I'm glad you raised this question because I think it is a crucial question. Will it figure in the next election? I don't know. If it does not figure, I would like to think it is because that there is a consensus on this already among not 100% of Singaporeans, but you know, a vast majority of Singaporeans. And so there is no political mileage to be gained for challenging the government's view on climate change. And I think you know what the government's view on climate change is. It is real, it is a serious problem, it is almost an existential problem, and at the last National Day rally, uh, PM Lee Sen Lung announced that we are going to have to spend $100 billion over the next 100 years to deal with it. That raises another question. Very few governments can make such an audacious announcement, $100 billion over the next 100 years. The problem with dealing with climate change, you mentioned Australia, but I can mention many other countries uh, also, is that you pay the costs up front. Whether they are political costs or financial costs, you pay the costs up front, you reap the benefits way, way down the road. Now, in any system of democratic politics, this is not a winning proposition. It is only because we have a fairly stable political uh, with some like and some don't like, that we can boldly say we are going to spend $100 billion over the next 100 years. And I hope that Nature Society tells all its members to vote wisely in the next election. Thank you. <laughs> okay. When we look at the opposition parties, I don't think any of them would critique or campaign against meritocracy, multiculturalism, and so on. Uh, not to be cruel to the Workers' Party. Uh, just Frank Tom Singh was my student at NUS. Uh, I like him. But you look at the Workers' Party, it's a bluer shade of white. <laughs> yeah. They are arguing that, hey, uh, we need checks and balances in Singapore. Right? You have to deny the PAP a more than two-thirds majority so they, to local lingo, uh, suka suka change the constitution. So that's the argument. They are not arguing against uh, the core values, uh, the template set by the uh, founding fathers, by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and the lieutenants. Um, Hong Kong. I need a problem with Hong Kong. Huh? I raised my student. Uh, personally, I think Hong Kong, <laughs> so, so either, her, her weekdays and weekends have been disrupted. Huh? Yeah. I think, not to be flippant, huh? I think Hong Kong lacks democracy and socialism. Um, Hong Kongers do not have the prerogative of Singaporeans. In, in Singapore, you know, if you are really alienated, you are really angry, you can throw out the PAP team. As in the case previously in Hong Kong, in 
Aljunied, right? You get really, really unhappy. That's a f so in Singapore, change, if need be, is by ballots, not bullets. Hong Kong, why no democracy? You cannot elect the chief executive. Many of the top uh, chaps hold multiple passports. Um, so Carrie Lam and her acolytes are not directly responsible to the people. And they lack socialism in the sense that, unlike Singapore, you know, Singapore we have the legislation for public housing, uh, infrastructure and so on. We can expropriate the land for a public good and then we compensate uh, the owners. But in Hong Kong, they're driven by at least five big property developers. They don't seem to have the option, you know. One country, two systems, they inherited the British law. Uh, British colonial government made a lot of money from land sales and so on. So that's the system. Uh, not to be cute or cheeky, I think that their problem for Hong Kong, lack of democracy, <laughs> lack of socialism. Can you imagine when private property prices in Hong Kong is more than double of New York and London? To me, this, this is crazy. Okay, it's a, it's a writer, you know, South China Morning Post. I, I'm not quite sure how you cover it. Okay, to... <laughs> Climate change. Uh, climate change, uh, Bilari already mentioned, uh, PM uh, flagged it at the national rally. But to many uh, youngsters, millennials, uh, idealistic, you see, what we do is simply too timid and too slow. Okay? But the trend, uh, what we are doing, what we are embarking on is uh, towards renewable energy. Um, is it fast enough? Uh, matter of opinion. Very strange, huh? I hope I don't uh, you know, offend any CEOs here from the power sector in Singapore. Um, I have a mainland Chinese scholar working on climate change came to me and said, hey, I think Singapore, you guys are not going full steam ahead, not in fourth gear on climate change. It's because you are a great refinery centre. Are you trying to you know, consider you know, at a certain pace where you're while refinery centers can adapt or what, I, I say I don't know. So I think some of you in the room will know the answer much better than me. Let me start with a more difficult question, climate change. Um, I think there is going to be a bifurcation of uh, opinions amongst the population depending on your age. This is a reality globally and this is going to get accentuated in Singapore. As to whether you can parlay that into votes, I'm not so sure because while you could argue that the government, to its critics, has been slow to respond to the needs of uh, climate change mitigation measures, it has realised and it has, as Bilahari said, it's going to pour massive investments. And as Peng Er said, there is, though, one elephant in the room, and that is the refinery business. I think it will have to tackle the issue, but if you look at it through the optics of uh, the elections, I don't think it's going to be an issue that's going to energise uh, voters on either side, to be perfectly candid. Um, on core values, I think Singapore is very fortunate that, thanks to our founding fathers, uh, there is a certain threshold of what are acceptable values and what are values that we frown upon. Um, as a minority, I think um, the core value of multiracialism is important. Uh, over the years, the core value of inclusivity is important. I think the debate is not over the core values that we have, but the debate should be the commitment to which we stick to these core values and how prepared we are to re-examine them at different points of our existence as a nation. I'm not so sure uh, we have done enough of that, but I think we're starting off on a very good footing where there is broad consensus. We are not a polarised society, we're not divided by these core values. So that's something positive for us. And I do think that DPM's Heng's slogan of Singapore together can resonate if it's fleshed out meaningfully. Um, on Hong Kong, I think there are better experts than me on this panel. Uh, 
they've touched on all the points that I wanted to touch on. Uh, I think Bilahari's point is very pertinent. And, and <coughs> the, you know, it's very... Um, whenever I come back to Singapore, which is quite often, I hear everybody wanting to talk about Hong Kong. Uh, Singaporeans are very preoccupied by what's going on there. And uh, it's tempting to draw comparisons between these two post-colonial Chinese majority societies. But I would want to caution against that. Uh, it's like comparing apples and oranges or egg tart and pandan cake. Um, they're very different. Um, I think the first reality that uh, Hong Kongers have to, to reckon with is that they are governed ultimately by a capital that's 2,000 kilometers away. Uh, over whom they have no say or little say. Um, the last time Singapore was in that position was when we were a colony and ruled out of Calcutta and then London. Uh, the second point is what uh, Penga alluded to about how there is really very limited universal suffrage in Hong Kong. The Legislative Council is elected, uh, but it's a combination of functional seats which go via sectors, and then you have directly elected seats um, and proportional representation. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, it's, they are not there to govern, they are there to block the government. Uh, Carrie Lam is elected by 1,198 uh, people, who are most of whom are pro-Beijing. And she, she and her members of her cabinet may say they want to work for the people, but the people can't kick them out if they're not performing. Unlike in Singapore. In Singapore, at the end of the day, we have a vote. And we can dismiss government leaders who are not performing. Um, and the third point, which Bilahari pointedly mentioned, is about the quality of administration. Unlike Singapore, the quality of administration in Hong Kong has increasingly shown itself to be lacking in capacity and increasingly unable to govern effectively. There are a couple of other factors. Um, one other um, big issue is for the last 20 years or so, Hong Kong is really effectively run by a bunch of oligarchs or business tycoons who call the shots. That may change in the future, hopefully. Um, and one other factor which I think Penga alluded to about housing. I'm not saying uh, this is the sole, sole cause. Um, there is no Hong Kong dream. Um, Every young person that I've come across, unless you intend to inherit your wealth or you're blessed enough to win the lottery or, you know, gamble in Macau, um, you are going to find your life worse off than your parents. Um, someone talked about housing and I, I, I looked up the figures just to be uh, precise and because uh, prices are softening but very slightly. So in Singapore, the average house, if you buy, the uh, income uh, to price ratio is 22. All things being equal, it will take you about 22 years to settle your loan. The figure in Hong Kong is 47. It will take you 47 years to finish off your housing loan. So it is a difficult uh, environment in which you want to be able to imagine your future, but you find that it is going to be a very difficult future. Um, I mention all these factors not to suggest that any single factor has contributed to the protests, but I think it's a combination. It's been a perfect storm of this confluence of interlocking factors. Uh, there is no way out at the moment. Yesterday, after a brief reprieve, the black clad protesters were out on the streets again. Um, but I think Singaporeans shouldn't worry that uh, you know, the Hong Kong-style protests would happen in Singapore. I think we are set underselling the basic competency of our system if we think that such a scenario can pan out in Singapore. So, I, 
Because ultimately, we have our votes. We have the ability to, to throw out an incompetent government. Um, at the end of the day, I think, I, I really disagree with people who say that, you know, if uh, Hong Kong-style protests happened in Singapore, Singapore would fail. Um, no, I think if Hong Kong-style protests happened in Singapore, it's the result of Singapore's failure, not the cause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we have the next set of questions, please? Uh, I see a Heng Chi and then uh, someone... Sorry, so, so there are three now. Huh? So I'm, I'm going to go this way, maybe. Uh, sorry, I think that, that the gentleman, you wait a while. Let, let Hing Chi go first, then the lady behind you, and then we'll come back to you. We'll take four this time. Please. Thank you, uh, Taeyong. Age before you. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the three speakers for their presentations. You know, it's really quite refreshing to hear again uh, revisit of Singapore politics. We don't hear it in the way that Pinger has presented it. It's a good old political science class. And I would like to congratulate in particular Zoraida for what you have done. You have explored opposition politics and analyzed opposition politics in Singapore with a very fine eye, which I don't think we have been, you know, able to see or hear for a while. And you have taken into consideration too what the new uh, politics is going to be like, politics in the cyberspace, you know, so the internet space. And I, what you said is really quite, I think, illuminating. I want to make a, and Bilahari, well, Bilahari, you know, I. In spite of our disagreements, I do agree with a lot of what you say. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to just correct Pinger on one thing. You said that you, know, you had to hear from the UN statistics about immigration. It's not true. You can get a hold of those statistics. Last year, uh, Sharon Siddiqui and I published a book, Singapore's Multiculturalism. It cost $200, so not a lot of people are uh, buying it, published by Routledge. But we were able to get exactly those statistics. We had published it in our book that, uh, you know, you can see where the sources of the immigration was coming from. If you look at the Chinese population, the numbers from PRC dropped substantially. Most of the new Chinese coming to Singapore came from Malaysia, South, other Southeast Asian countries. But it's all there. So don't say that, you know, uh, it is not that transparent. Mind you, saying that, I still say government must be prepared to share data with researchers and with business because you have to have data to do good business. So, yes, but really you, we can still milk much more the data from the published sources. I want to make a point that I didn't hear the speakers make about politics in Singapore. I think we really underestimate how rational and how smart the Singapore electorate is. They really are smart. I remember in 2015, I was in a cab the day before the elections, and the chattering classes, me included, um, you know, thought that the PAP would do worse. The, and I think PAP was quite surprised when the results came out in 2015 that they did as well as they did. But I was in a cab and there was this taxi man speaking to me in a combination of Singlish and Mandarin. I asked him how he thought the government would do. And I think he reflects the average Singapore person. He said, I think PAP will do better. They've done something. They haven't done everything, but they've done something. So they'll get more votes than they have before. You, you remember after 2011, there was a slew of social policies, subsidies, and so on, that really made up for some of the complaints and grievances that caused 2011 
to be a really bad election for the government. But he said, we shouldn't give them 70%, because if you give them 70%, PAP will be arrogant, and GST will go up immediately <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, he's very smart. He's a taxi driver. I wrote a column after that saying, the next day I, after the elections, I went to the office with a humble pie, having baked it the night before. But the electorate is rational and is, in fact, smart. And I think opposition parties have to take that into consideration. And they know how to game their vote. I think the issues of the future, as you all have said, will be of a particular kind. We have a good DNA. Singapore voters have a good DNA. We have imbibed the values that the first generation of politicians, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his colleagues, have ingrained in us, have socialized us into. But those values can change. Meritocracy we believe in, but how is meritocracy practiced? And the argument is not whether meritocracy is good or bad, but how do you practice meritocracy? Multiracialism, how do you practice multiracialism? And again, that's where the room for debate is. The, we are in an age of identity politics now, and so I would watch that space, how people express their identity and the multiracial um, character. So I think those values we believe in are there, but those values will be contested is in terms of implementation. Thank, right, thank you, Heng Chi, for those uh, additional points which are excellent. I, I think I'm just going to move, was it someone? Yeah. And then, then you, sorry, I, I'm going to come to you. Please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Wong Wai Wai. So uh, Professor Chan just mentioned the smart work the workers. So, I'm wondering how will they react to a potential factor, the, the potential entry of Mr. Lee Hsien Yang, and also, uh, I hope it's appropriate to discuss here, <laughs> and, and also maybe the, the, the grandsons of uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as well, you know, uh, whether you know, they revert to some kind of personality, kind of politics. Uh, revert means like there's some kind of bad judgment on my part, but we are discussing about values versus competency. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, the lady at the back, sorry I missed you earlier. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, I'm Michelle Lee from the Progress Singapore Party. And um, thank you very much to Professor Chan and to the speakers. And I'd just like to address this to Ms. Ibrahim of the SCMP. Um, thank you again <laughs> for saying that Dr. Tan could be a potential game changer in the next elections, and I will be sure to convey this to him. Um, uh, my question is a personal one. Uh, in Singapore, in the news, I've noticed a tendency, um, whenever there are international studies that we score very well in, um, that these are sort of very um, but, uh, proudly kind of banded about, and um, whereas there are international studies where we score much lower, and we tend to gloss over them. Gloss over them. Um, conversely, in Hong Kong newspapers, because I've uh, lived there for some time before, um, I often see news articles on how Hong Kong is losing out to Singapore, that there's, um, how, how can they better compete with Singapore? So my question is, do you think that, um, what do you think this slant shows about our national psyche? Or do you think it shows something about our national psyche? And um, will this prevent us from being more competitive, um, for us, prevent us from striving to be better, and hinder our awareness of how quickly other countries are developing? And um, also, I'd like to say that, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot spoken about trust between government and the people. And um, what do you think of it as a reciprocal relationship that, the people of Singapore have shown a lot of trust in the government, and um, how can the government show more trust in Singaporeans? And I agreed with one of Dr. Lam's questions about, um, can this trust be shown by being more open with data, um, such as um, health treatment costs, the construction costs of HDB flats, 
um, the compensation packages of those managing our sovereign wealth funds. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Um, sir? Testing. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ian and I'm from RI. Firstly, I want to thank all the speakers for their sharings. I enjoyed it very much. Um, so I'll try to keep this short, so pardon me. Um, I start with the assumption that Singaporean students are largely non or apolitical. And um, it seems to me that these days the government seems more enthusi enthusiastic about youth caring more about issues in our society and actually going about championing them. However, I was just curious, um, how do you think the government would react if this activism sort of spilled over into the politicization of students, for, especially if this politicization takes an anti-establishment stance? And do you think the government will be accepting of these new forms of student activism? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for your question about um, why do Hong Kong newspapers seem preoccupied with comparing Singapore with Hong Kong. Um, I've, I've often thought about that myself, uh, being someone who sees herself as commuting between these two cities. I think it has to do with the fact that um, Singapore does loom large in the average imagination of Hong Kongers because of how the societies were once former British colonies, they are Chinese majority societies, as I said earlier, but also there's a sense that Singapore has gotten far ahead than Hong Kong. Uh, and this is proven by the numbers. When uh, Hong Kong was handed over to the Chinese in 1997, the Hong Kong GDP per capita was bigger than Singapore. I don't have the numbers with me at, right here, but right now, um, the Singapore GDP per capita is US 51,000, 51, I think, compared to Hong Kong's 43,000. But these are just uh, big numbers. I think the reality is that um, there's a sense of um, disappointment that, you know, we were named one of Asia's world cities. Financially, we look very good, we are doing very well. But why is it there's this other uh, little city out there in Southeast Asia doing just as well? So there is that sense of rivalry and competition that I think the newspapers are only trying to reflect. And conversely, I think that uh, Singaporeans actually, until the Hong Kong protests, do not have Hong Kong top of their minds. I think because we are more cosmopolitan, we have outgrown Hong Kong, I think, as our so-called uh, competitor psychologically. So I think that perhaps may explain the difference in our approach and our coverage. Um, on the question of trust, uh, as someone who is from foreign media, I think it's best if I leave that question to Binga to answer. <laughs> I don't think the Singapore establishment has made any bones or been apologetic about the fact that if you are studying, you should be studying. Uh, politics should be a bit further from your mind. But at the same time, I don't think they've been so intolerant as to not allow uh, speakers or to allow some form of activity uh, by students. Uh, but I think, again, uh, if I... If I can just anticipate uh, the, the, what was beneath that question. Uh, that's really to compare student activism in Hong Kong versus in Singapore. I think student activism in Hong Kong, <laughs> I sometimes think that it's in mother's milk. Uh, because since 1997, Hong Kongers have only known one major way of making their views heard, and that is going out to the streets. 
So in 2003, you had them going out to the streets and Article 23, which, was, uh, which is a piece of legislation uh, that pertains to national security. That was aborted, shelved. 2012, again, you had Hong Kongers going out to the streets to protest against uh, the changes to the national uh, curriculum. Again, that was shelved. And then 2014, you had the Occupy movement. That was in protest against a framework that was meant to give universal suffrage to Hong Kong. Um, again, that was rejected. And so you, and now you have these protests which have continued for eight months. Um, I don't think that protest mindset will go away anytime soon. I think it will wax and wane depending on some sort of uh, agreement that both sides come to. It can well be a war of attrition. It can well be um, some sort of basic uh, understanding. And it can also have to do with the wider public. I got the sense that over Christmas, actually, the majority of Hong Kongers who actually are solidly behind the protests were getting a bit um, wary of the protests. So there was a bit of a uh, period of calm. Uh, whether that calm will last, that was broken yesterday. Whether it will prevail in the coming weeks and months, we shall have to see. Okay. Uh, Michelle's question, uh, trust, data, greater transparency. My short answer is yes, we need to know so that the uh, public uh, and the state, we can work hand in hand to forge better public policies. Um, Michelle's question about national psyche. National psyche. Um, my sense is that Hong Kong Hong Kongers, especially the millennials, uh, in terms of identity and the education they receive, they are taught by many teachers who are anti-China. Okay? A few generations of uh, migrants from mainland China, escaping from mainland China, instinctively, they tend to be critical of China. So, you see students in, in Hong Kong, in terms of value and identity, they do not identify themselves with the Chinese mainland. Uh, Singapore is very, very different. Uh, our national education is pro-Singapore. Hong Kong's education is anti-China. Okay, I, I hate to put it in such stark and uh, crude terms. Uh, a question about uh, smart voters, Li Xian Yang, Li Hongyi, that's really, 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 really speculative, okay? So if you put a gun against my head, and ask, will Li Xian Yang be standing in election? I think the best thing is to ask him. But <laughs> I, I suspect he may, he may uh, provide political funding to one particular uh, political party. He, he had actually expressed quite openly that uh, he's sympathetic to Tan Cheng Bok's party and values, okay? Uh, but whether he stands as a candidate, I mean, he's a Singapore citizen. It's the prerogative of all Singapore citizens to stand as a candidate. But uh, that's, that's up to him. Uh, Lee Hong Yi, of course, there'll be a buzz in Singapore if Lee Hong Yi were to run in the forthcoming election, right? If he wants to be a politician, he has to run in this coming election and not in the following, following uh, election cycle because of age. But the problem is, when he runs for for, for election. You know, there's nothing to say that if you are third generation, you are, you are no good, there's nepotism and so on. I'm not saying that. In fact, if you look at Koizumi Shinjiro, which I mentioned earlier, he, he's from my university, no? uh, Columbia University, did his master's there. He's a very impressive guy. And he may be a future sav uh, saviour of the Liberal Democratic Party and perpetuate its uh, one-party dominance in, uh, in Japan. Uh, I, I just had dinner with Professor Israel Ogle, last uh, Saturday evening, last, and, and he told me he had a very, very good conversation with uh, the leaders of Singapore, including Mr. Heng Sui Kiat, Mr. Koizumi Jinichiro, but he didn't, he met Carrie Lam, you know, but he, he only praised the Singapore and the Japanese side. He didn't really have, <laughs> I think I shouldn't uh, implicate 
Professor Vogel. Okay, let's just say that he had, he had good things to say about Singapore and, Hong, uh, and Japan, okay? Hong Kong, hmm. Um, but the problem is, if Lee Hong Yee were to run, many Singaporeans, you know, the parliament of the streets, in the hawker centres, the coffee shops, you'll see that, no offence to anyone here, uh, Heng Sui Kiat will be uh, interpreted. He will be a, a seat warmer, even though I think that will... That is an unfair statement because whoever runs in parliament, you have to, if you are elected, you have to prove yourself. Okay, you, you just don't have a, a pass. You know, if you belong to a Lee family, therefore it's an escalator up to be the prime minister. Many things can happen, right? Many things can can happen. Um, so, so I don't know. I think he's uh, too young. In fact, uh, I, I really, I mean, I'm really uh, skating on uh, thin ice huh? when you ask me <laughs> these kind of questions. Unanswerable, actually. So foolish of me to to, to answer. Uh, how smart is the Singapore electorate? A again, you know, uh, are we saying that Malaysian voters are stupid, American voters are stupid, British voters are stupid in a referendum? I, I dare not say. You know. If Singapore voters were to vote in a certain pattern, I, I, I don't think it's quite fair for an analyst to say that they are smart or they are stupid. But we have to understand wh why they voted that way. Okay, why they voted that way. Whether it's smart or stupid is a matter of interpretation. Uh, last question by uh, Professor Chan Heng Chi. You see, I'm very used to being corrected by Professor Chan Heng Chi. <laughs> she, she first corrected me in 1980, when I was a first year student in the political science department. You know? I, I, I'm incorrigible, so she's uh, correcting me after 40 years. <laughs> Honest year, she was uh, my esteemed uh, professor. And in fact, she actually, she, she was, you know, so, persuas so persuasive, she actually persuaded me to leave a very lucrative job at the Development Bank of Singapore to join the political science department. I uh, took a pay cut, okay? So it's not only PAP ministers taking pay cut. I mean, I took a pay cut to serve at the NUS. Uh, thank you. Okay, yeah, very short. Thank uh, But I, I have a right of reply, not just to be corrected, you know? Okay? You see, a few years ago, I, at uh, Chinese New Year, because all the Chinese stores were closed, so I have to eat Malay food at uh, Adam Road Hawker Centre. And Sylvia Liam was seated next to an iconic football player. You, you know who that guy is? And asked Sylvia, hey Sylvia, we don't know, you know the statistics of where our migrants are from. It's only in broad categories. And Sylvia told me, okay, I'll raise it in Parliament. I don't think they'll give me a figures. Kind of long story short, you know how a minister replied in Parliament? It is better for us not to know. You know, can, can, you, can you explain any parliament with that kind of answer in parliament? It's better for us not to know. Uh, on Sunday, please check. Uh, Prof Chan, please be prepared to be corrected. Okay? The Sunday edition of the Streets Times stated very clearly that this was the very, very first time the breakdown, country-specific, this is the very, very first time released to the uh, Singapore public. So, I assume the Streets Times is correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, please. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, I want to respond to Penga's point about how all the teachers in Hong Kong are anti-China and all the students are groomed to be anti-Chinese. I don't think it's that cut and dried. I think you have to remember that uh, the pro-establishment camp is still sizable, one. Two, I don't think the sentiment is necessarily anti-China all the time by everyone. I think it waxes and wanes. If you remember in 2008, when Beijing hosted the Olympics, Hong Kongers were amongst the most vocal of supporters. If you remember the Sichuan earthquake, Hong Kongers donated a lot of money uh, to help the motherland. So I think it's a relationship that um, changes over time depending on the issues at hand. And for many young Hong Kongers, despite this sentiment that they are being let down by the government, there is a very strong sense of identity. They feel very, very proud to be Hong Konger. They're very, very proud of their Cantonese. They're very, very proud of their ways of life. Um, such that if you look at their telegram channels when they are in a very reflective mood, it can be very um, sad and it's, it's a very emotional uh, movement in the sense that they're very, very idealistic. They, they think and imagine of a Hong Kong that once was um, theirs 
and even though they were not born uh, before 1997 for the vast majority of these young protesters, they imagined a Hong Kong that was relatively free, that may or may not be connected to the mainland, but has its freedoms. Um, and that narrative is what is keeping the movement alive, this sense of letting Hong Kong be Hong Kong. Um, I just want to end by saying that uh, I want to thank Professor Chan for not correcting me <laughs> in public. She was also my teacher. She's corrected me many times in private. Not quite a reputation, Heng <laughs> Ching. <laughs> uh, okay. Since we are running out of time, I'll be very brief. Um, Heng Ching has corrected me many times. It did not take. <laughs> I'm much more intransigent, obviously, than either Peng or... I just want to, to respond to two things. One is whether the Singapore government can tolerate greater politicization of, of, of students. Well, it really depends what you mean by politicization. If you get involved in, more in debating issues, in speaking about issues, I think there will be that tolerance. If you get involved in the way Hong Kong students are getting involved uh, by breaking things in the street, I don't think there will be, uh, be zero tolerance. Um, and that brings me to a different point, which is actually a point that Heng Chi made vis-a-vis -vis core values. You get, it's not so much whether you agree with the core values or not, it's how you, what your vision is of implementing them. Similarly, when you criticize or you get politicized, it's not just a matter of saying white when the government says black. You have to have some viable alternative. Like for example, I think in Hong Kong, all the five demands of the protesters cannot be met. And I don't think the protesters are so silly to think that they can be met. It is really, to my mind, and Zoraida will know better because she lives there, uh, working for Jack Ma. <laughs> uh, it, is really, it is really a deep sense of frustration and in fact almost desperation. That does not exist in Singapore. So if you want to be politicized, you have to come up with better governance solutions. Huh? Otherwise, if you think the role of a political opposition is merely to cry black when the government says white, or to ensure the government will not get a blank check without, any viable, without providing viable alternatives, it reminds me very much of what Dr. Mahathir said after the last general election. He said, I didn't expect to win, so I don't have to keep all my promises. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I see that we have about three minutes left on the clock. So if there's one or two last pressing question, yes, I see one here and one here. So those will be the last two. And I'm sorry, I, I, one I think. Yeah. Okay. And then the, I'll ask the panelists to wrap up. With, in response to your questions as well. Okay, um, sir, you were there first. Why don't you start first? Hello, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful sharing for um, all the speakers on stage and everything they've been hearing. Um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned a lot about the Duverges theorem, if I uh, pronounce that word right. And in your last statement, you said even after he won, Dr. Mahathir said, I don't have the plans because I didn't expect to win. So I'm coming from a perspective that says today's topic is parts taken. My question is, imagine you are the panelist in the next 20 or 30 years from today. What kind of new parts do we as Singaporeans, both as incumbent government PAP and the opposition parties, have to take? So in the next 20, 30 years, we can look back and say that the new parts taken were something that made this nation a brighter, a shinier dot in the world. Because my concern is, we didn't speak at all from a perspective of are we too much in a comfort zone to even think what's happening in Hong Kong won't happen here because maybe they also did not think that although we are very different in the upbringing and the education system and everything that you have shared. My concern is are we in denial, number one? Number two, are we living too much in comfort zone that we are not even... Um, seeing a possibility of such a thing happening and if there's going to be such a thing what are the new parts that we should consider as the elite of Singapore as the think tank of Singapore thank you thank you I want to hear the panel's view on the 2015 election the PAP government were was pleasantly surprised 
and the opposition party were unpleasantly shocked with the result. Is it because our electorates were rational and smart like Professor Chan said? Or was there a possibility of a reverse freak re-election? Let me quickly explain uh, what I mean. Uh, there were rumours somewhere in between the nine days that, you know, PAP is going to lose big. There were a lot of fear on the ground, basically. I'll give you a story. I have a friend, family, not very happy, PAP government. Six of them in the car went for, the, went for election. They all wanted to vote for opposition. So they had a discussion. So they all agreed that uh, they all said that they would vote for the opposition. But once they came up for polling poll, then they had another, like, another discussion. And everybody says, since all of you are giving your votes to the opposition, I decided to give my vote to the PAP. <laughs> <laughs> What's the chance that the reverse election could have caused a tilt in as far as the result is concerned? Okay. Panel's view, Thank please. you. So I'm going to ask uh, Pinga to start first this time, and then the rest to follow, and to also wrap up their thoughts uh, in about uh, half a minute each. Okay, so that's fake news, right? My short answer, maybe we slap off mount them. Okay, more seriously, uh, 2015, uh, PAP uh, benefited from two major, uh, two major things. One, Golden Jubilee. Uh, second, the demise of founding father, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. So at least for that moment in time, it brought the nation together. Uh, that's, not, that's not going to be repeated in 2020. Thank you. I think I already alluded to what happened in 2015 and how there was a cost correction after 2011, the gains that the opposition won. So I think the more appropriate question is whether there'll be a cost correction yet again this time against the PAP's favour. I think that's something that uh, you might want to look out for, but this is me just being a pundit. Um, I think the question that I really want to end off on is really this um, slogan of Singapore Together. Can we be different and yet stay together? Thanks. Thank you. Well, 2015 elections, I think I kind of agree with Heng Chi because I think mistakes were made in 2011. The mistakes were corrected, not 100%, but enough so that the government was seen as responsive and was uh, and won, and won, right? Uh, that said, elections are always a crapshoot. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> right? And that brings me to my final point, which is a wrap-up point. I do agree with the Sikh gentleman that being complacent <laughs> would be probably the greatest danger Singapore faces. Face I don't think we are in that complacent comfort zone at present. In fact, if you listen to what government ministers and uh, have been saying, they have been saying over and over again, we are heading into uncharted territory, globally, right? Because of a whole variety of uh, developments, uh, some of which I mentioned. But that does not mean we cannot fall into a comfort zone. We cannot become complacent. And if that happens, we are done for. Thank you. Well, that's a great wrap-up statement. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking our three speakers, Zoraida, Pinger, Bilahari, and for your questions as well.